So welcome everybody. We've got Emma Tolbert with us here today and um, we are really in Emma's studio. So that, yeah. that's the exciting thing. I think Emma's made um, a dash out today. You say it was, it was your first time in the studio. Pretty much the first time in the studio, yeah. Yeah, yeah I've so been in some... isolation. Yeah, this is so this is good to get back in to see where you were at. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that long ago before it before it closed down that we came to see you. I think even was it? I was, the, the show was going to open on the first of May, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I was pretty sort of on course. Well, I was on course to get everything done for the show by the end of March. Yeah. So yeah. I think there was you know something like a a couple of weeks left before my own deadline because then I was going to be going away anyway. Yeah, so that's quite, it's quite amazing to see how you, how you were on schedule, how much planning you were having to do at that point and getting everything done, getting it done. Cause yeah. you had a lot of shows coming yeah. up, didn't you? So, yeah. There was a, yeah. yeah, there was a crazy schedule and that's then really strange when everything stops and you're in a kind of free fall, you know, yeah. that you, that you just re recognize how the pace was and in a way I don't know there are good and not so good things about it but it's been quite interesting to be able to be more broadly experimental you know yeah, yeah that's what's been interesting what because I suppose it's quite hard you know we're all a lot of us are in this similar position of this sort of feeling like it's stalling and trying to keep your, keep your brain going and keep yourself um, positive. So it's yeah. just, that's what I thought was really interesting the first time that I saw those animations that you were posting on Instagram. It yeah. just looked like you would immerse yourself into a whole new world within your world. I mean, it was like very, very quickly that I realized that I can't go to the studio. Um, and also uh, I wasn't well at the beginning of the lockdown, yeah. but I then thought, well, if I've got this time, I can teach myself the software that I've always wanted to teach myself. And in fact, I've been saying, I'd really like to make an animation and never ever doing it, imagining that it would take me about a year <laughs> to do it. And then, um, yeah, so it seemed really suitable that I would just start playing around with this software. And very quickly, I realized it was like going into, where, where I would make a drawing and it would be a static image. I realized making the animation is like, almost like inviting someone else to sort of step into the imaginary world that's in my head for drawing and walk around mm -hmm. in it a bit more, have a bit more kind of space to look about. And also I'd be making a lot of sound pieces. So it brought together a number of different things for me. And I had the material of my drawings already that I could use for the animations. So it just seemed a very um, sort of direct thing to happen. It totally does. The thing that keeps coming back to me is this, is this sense within your work about what is, what is happening right now, but also pushing into the future, this future projecting, looking back at the past. Um, but and, and somehow the, I keep coming back to the title of, of the show that, you know, the, so this title that you proposed, When Screens Break, and it's yeah. such a, uh, it felt like the first time you sent it me, I thought it was such an unusual phrasing for, for a title. But mm. um, it, it soon sunk in a sort of sense of what it is, this sort of fracture and interesting, just looking behind your head now, looking at these breaks, these cracks yeah. in the screens. And, yeah how thing, the idea that things can fall through and I don't know, you sort of enter into a whole other world through it somehow. It just felt, it still feels like bizarrely prophetic and, and oddly aligned with what has happened over the past, you know, three, four months now. Um, Very interesting that a lot of contemporary artists were involved with a sort of projection into a speculative future, a sort of, fictional future, that it was quite a sort of common um, area that people were really uh, considering what, what could happen because we're, on, we're in a point of like huge technological change and we're, we're at a point, it felt like we were at a point where we were hurtling towards 
disasters, you know, ecological disasters, but we're also hurtling towards this kind of um, way of living that is so distinctly different than the way we might have lived, like we might live now, but we might have lived, say, even five years ago. Mm -hmm. So that sort of rapid shifting and rapid change of consciousness as well meant that I think a lot of artists picked up on that and started to sort of push it a bit more, you know, push it forwards imaginatively, like what really would happen in those yeah. situations. But what, what strikes me about the situation we're in now is that it's almost like this sort of breaking point that we were looking towards fictionally is here. You know, yeah. we're, in, we're at the point, you know, it, my show was titled When Screens Break, thinking about when we have a very different relationship to technology. And what I mean by that is that I was thinking about how we became very, very devices and how they became like our friends, how we would turn to a device to find out sort of information, but also to entertain us. And the devices mm. sort of gave back to us this sort of very um, seductive kind of uh, relationship, which was yeah. like we were really into each other, us and our devices. And I, and I was thinking that um, at some point in the future, the way that we'll be kind of connected to technology would be, wouldn't need a device, it wouldn't need a physical device. There would be ways that we would just be networked in. And yeah. at that point, we might look back at the physical world or, you know, we might be in a VR space for our own safety. This is what I was imagining. We might have to extract ourselves from the outside world. And I was thinking for ecological reasons, but mm. we might have to extract ourselves. We might have to be in a VR space. We might have to all be networked for our own good. <laughs> we might you know, we might look back to the sort of tangible, tangible and the physical world with some sort of romanticized regret and think, you know, we really, we missed that period of time where we were being seduced because at yeah. some point in the future, probably we won't need to be seduced because all our data will have been harvested and, we, you know, there's nothing more to sort of seduce us to give. Yeah. So that, that was really the premise for the show and this idea that when you're using a phone say and the screen breaks like you drop your phone and the screen shatters it's like it's almost like could be one of the worst things that happens <laughs> because you've so much in that instant yeah so uh, it was really about that sort of fra fragile state but as it happens it, there were things in the text i mean you know this gavin because you've yeah. read some the text but the, the work has text in in it alongside images and a lot of those texts do refer to this sort of virtual reality space being the space that we hide in when the rest of the world is rotten and full yeah. of viruses it actually says that so it's almost as if it, I don't think it was like being you know someone who's like a, a visionary who can see into the future I think we all sort of could see it happening yeah. And we could all see the same things. And it was really articulating that that's what it's like for us alive today. And that's, for me, importantly, what the work tries to do. It just addresses the things that I'm particularly caught up by. Yeah. You know. well, it's quite an, that's quite an interesting question about that idea of the vision, like having a vision. We sort of, I tend to think of it as this exceptional moment of, you know, something beyond what can ever happen in a normal situation and it suddenly comes and it's there and it may link. But actually, you just sort of made me think about the creative act of just working through an idea and, and following a narrative and a logic and making a drawing, writing mm. a text, putting it down. That in, a, in a weird way, that's sort of like normalising the idea of projecting forward, of having a vision, but making it quite matter of fact it's just like it's attainable through creative process it's quite I, a I think it's something that we're all doing anyway all the time i mean without really being too sort of conscious of it is that in order to really apprehend the world to be able to deal with the world i think we have to be able to remember our previous experiences to inform us yeah. so that we're not permanently shocked 
you know, we can be shocked by the world at the moment, but yeah. so that we're not in a permanent state of like fear and shock at what we're looking at. But also we have to, we have in our, our brains are able to project forwards to anticipate what could be. So yeah. that again, we're not like shocked by, yeah. by you know, the, the sort of ever present kind of moments that we're in. So it just struck me that our brains are very imaginative and inventive and we're doing, so we're doing that kind of visionary thing anyway, because yeah. So we're all anticipating. anticipating it's sort of yeah. anticipating and intuitive and it's, it's, it's also quite it's a weird one when you realize that the anticipated like at the start of lockdown the first the experience is like when i well, I actually went to london for a day before lockdown but it maybe, maybe it was the day that we came to visit you and it already felt um apocalyptic it already felt but it wasn't but it wasn't a shock because i knew it because I've seen it in fiction. And so that's what was unusual, this sense of it being real, but my experience that makes me not shocked is actually from fiction and lo looking at films and or reading books or comics or... The, most odd. of this stuff is how we inform ourselves about the world anyway, you know, yeah. isn't it? It was right? just much more, it felt like a cl more clear that it was yeah what of what reality was that disjoint between the things that you just tell your brain and the things yeah. that then you've just you've experienced at first hand than actually how how much the same that is but i think i think you're sort of pointing out something that is quite important to me in my work is that i'm i don't want to make the narratives that are in the work dramatic you know they're not I don't want them to be like a fiction, like a drama. Yeah. I don't want them to be extended in that way, like they're they're, yeah, fictional in the sense that it couldn't, it isn't part of what people are really thinking now. I'd like to think of it more like a conversation about, you know, the thoughts that are being processed today. So, yeah. I'm I sort of think I share an experience that you're describing is that I think on the tube at the beginning of the pandemic, when we weren't in lockdown, I think I kept sort of imagining, this is like a Hollywood film and then something happens yeah. and everybody sort of, it, it's all very dramatic. You know, you, you right. could never yourself to think that. But how, do you, how, how do you think that you, you, you approach that then within the works then to stop that, the drama? Is it, because you, you include yourself within it, isn't it, the, 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 the figure? Yeah. Yeah, the figure is always an idea of me. Um, and it's like a sort of notion of some, someone like myself, or myself, my idea of myself from inside, sort of quite often moving around exploring, like trying to figure stuff out, trying to sort of understand. Yeah. Um, and when I, uh, if I'm starting um, a body of work, then I make a lot of drawings to try to see what it is that, I'm thinking about and that can be text or that can be image or it can be a sort of abstract thing and there's a feeling that this sounds kind of it's hard to explain but there's a feeling that I have when I'm making a drawing when I know that I'm really connected to the thing I'm drawing like I really mean that I really think that I really feel that yeah. it really does uh, describe in some way something that I genuinely um, think and feel and I know that feeling and I know when I'm not very attached to a drawing also. Huh. But, but for the most part, I'm looking for that um, sensibility, which is really sort of pulling out for myself um, these sort of genuine thoughts. Yeah. You know? um, How does that feel to when you revisit them then after a bit, period of time? Um, I feel quite like, I feel very comfortable always looking at my work because I feel like I don't have an anxiety about whether I think it's um, good enough or not. I feel very sort of at ease about my work. But I also sometimes, because you can't remember everything, sometimes I look back at things like texts that I've painted, you know, that I've written or images and I feel like that actually does something kind of that's more than I imagined it was at the time of making 
So there's a sort of gap where I'm making them and I'm not very precious about them. I might make a lot of drawings at once. And I sit at a desk and I'm making the drawings and I'm just literally throwing them on the floor and I've done them in a pile yeah. Yeah. on the floor or laying them out on the floor and just looking at them and sort of thinking about how they develop a bigger body of work. But sometimes I look back and think that there's a sort of potency in some of the drawings that I didn't recognize, you know. Yeah, I mean, that was a bit that we still were to go through as well. We were, we were thinking within the exhibition, there'd be this very large cir circle within a circle, hanging space of, of paintings, but then there would be this extra sort of index to those panels and the narrative that's on them with the other drawings. Have you, have you got some of them there? Could we can show the scale of those and what those... Yeah. So I have like a text drawing, so, so on like really thin yeah. um, Himalayan paper and you know, or it might be like this on just sugar paper that, that they're text that I write as I'm putting the words down. You know, I don't know what I'm going to write before and I just uh -huh. make the lines. I don't have any sort of blank ones to show you because I just do it all in the same time. I just make the lines, the shapes of the lines, and then I okay. start writing in words that um, occur to me. But then, you, but then you do, you, then you use some of those words into the larger paintings. Right, and yeah. so the larger paintings that I'm going to take you on a little walk about. Oh, yeah, so sure. Let's try. larger paintings. I've got to switch my, I've got to get into your painting as well. Hold on, I'm going to switch mine. Oh yeah, we can match. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'm in the painting as well now. We're there. Okay. So the <laughs> the paintings have um, the text in them that come from um, my drawings, but also they, while I'm in the studio, I might have a space that I know a text is going to go there. Yeah. And I don't know when I'm making the painting what it's going to say, but as I'm making it, it, you know, words sort of formulate in my mind and I think that's what I'm going to put in that space. So yeah. it, it, there's a sort of half and half of being prepared with the number of drawings that give the uh, sort of preparation, if you like, material. So I, I spotted the, uh, the, 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 the text balloon there that said, breathing bad air full of viruses. Yeah, so Again. that image is, behind yeah, you. The one day I was posting the image of you and sort of was zooming in to check that it had enough detail and that was the phrase that came up, yeah. which, which sort of, I'd sort of forgotten it was there almost. So. That panel is, so it, maybe I, I can explain just so it makes sense. For the show, for the um, proposal for the When Screens Break show, um, I propose to make a very big, circular shape of silk painted hangings so it'd be like a total circle that you could walk around the outside of but yeah, there would be openings on either side of that that you could walk into it and then inside that would be another circle of hangings but they would be transparent so and they're big aren't they it's about it's about eight or nine meters wide something like that big it's and three big. meters tall yeah. Right, right. And it, it fills the space. And so on the outside, the idea was that you would see on one side, you would see something like this behind me, which is the idea of a network that, yeah. you know, we don't actually know what networks look like. Mm -hmm. But you would see this idea, these sort of ideas of networks, imaginary sort of descriptions of networks. And then you would see figures all around that who were sort of going through the issues that come with our interface with technology, our, our sort of yeah. relationship with technology and how we give ourselves away to technology and how we, we allow it to sort of command us sometimes and things like that. Yeah. And then on, there were other panels which were um, like this one and the one behind Gavin, which is people walking about in the world, but the world is like a, bars of rotten flowers it's like a natural space but it's kind of expired in some way and they're walking around 
as if they're in this stinky space and they're sort of thinking, even though this is horrific, it's still sort of magical. The world is still beautiful and magical. And why would we exile ourselves from such a magical place? So that's the outside and it's a circle like it's a world. Mm -hmm. And then you go inside as if you sort of go into this space of technology, like sort of VR space. That's my thinking anyway. And that would be the transparent hangings, which were all like sort of broken screens. Like, can you see the one behind me there? Yeah. That's that's on voil, so it's transparent. Mm -hmm. So it would be like you walked into a space where, you know, the surfaces were smashed. Everything was smashed. And And you you really be able to see through into the centre space then through that through that panel. Yeah, you'd be you'd be able to see through, but you'd kind of have this, um, you know, something like a screen in front of you that's like smashed. And then inside that, you would see a three dimensional piece, which is. Um, that's also a, a bit that we've still to fully still, work still. out how it goes in and yeah. yeah but the idea of that was that it would be a, a figure on a platform and that platform would be like the format of a very large um phone with a me- metallic surface that was smashed and the figure would be looking down into that surface a bit like a kind of narcissus looking into a, a pond and seeing themselves reflected back but that image is shattered so sort of to say that the being like a being an idea of oneself is at the center of things then the other things that are surrounding it are um sort of fragile and under threat i guess that's what I'm about. In, a, in a way, I'm really excited about being able to walk back into a gallery and walk around an object and and see someone else through a transparent screen and you know make those encounters. You sort of realise just looking at the images, or when I've been looking at images that you that you've sent me, you know, still how how removed that is from the real the real experience. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. The images sort of tend to work fairly well on screens because they're so um, pictorial, I guess, or they're so sort of highly patterned. Or, um, but there is something about seeing the fact that they're painted on silk and the quality of that material or seeing that it's a transparent surface or seeing the surfaces of the three-dimensional work, which are all painted surfaces. And just yeah. the qualities of the materials and the experience of being in the space. Oh, and the other thing that I haven't mentioned is there's a sound piece which yes. I found to go with it, which is something that I've been doing with installations, it's making a kind of digital sound piece. Yes, yeah, really. And I, cause I've heard, you've sent me a couple of versions of that now. And I, and I think when, also when I saw the animations, it really felt so full and complete with the sound and the images working together. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, maybe that it would be good to show everyone um, a bit of the animation. Let's see if we can. Do you want to try and get that get that yeah. running? Because I just think that's an interesting back and forth between what's going okay. on in the images, what's happening spatially, and then what's happening with the idea of the moving images as well in the sound. Right. Um, this is an experimental. See if I can do it. Yeah. See if it works. Oh, you can't yes. hear the sound. But you can't hear the sound. This is the problem I had. Hmm. Um, Emma, once you, when you, um, this is Yaz from Eastside Projects. Hey, everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, when you um, join, it says on the bottom mm-hmm. of the share screen page, share computer audio as a little tick. So if you exit this, yeah, and then do it again. Okay. And on the screen that it says um, share audio, you've got kind of the whiteboard, you've got the annotation and the different options. On that screen, there's a little box in the bottom left-hand corner that should say share computer sound. Mm, sorry, I need you to I need you to <laughs> describe that again. Yeah, okay, of course. I'll come out. 
Um, so if once you click share screen, yeah, it will come up with some different uh -huh, options. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I found it. Okay, brilliant. Right, just let me, I need to go back and open it again. Sorry to be so slow. <laughs> We've got time. <laughs> Sorry about this. So, let's see if it works. Ah. very short. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good to see it like that though, mixing in with just on here, the way that it functions on Zoom actually, that really works well. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how good the quality is, but they're very sort of like paper cut out, you know, they, they really are from the drawings on paper. Yeah, you can't, you can't quite see the detail on here because it just breaks it down a little bit too much, but I mean we're gonna, it's definitely something we're super excited about to try and work out how to build that in around the experience of the show as well. Yeah. And that, that bit at the end, what, what were you, was that just something that you discovered while you were making it that when you embed the figure and it suddenly becomes this kind of crystallized yeah. rock formation almost? It's, yeah, it's, it's just a, you know, it's an effect. And what I realized is that if I applied that effect to the drawing that it looked like um, a stone carving or a fossil and I then had it in my head that oh my god that's so exciting because the you know the all of the animations come under this sort of umbrella title which is um, outside the freedom that's only in your head so they're all really about imagining being outside yeah. but this in this very short animation it's as if the woman is walking around in a sort of a very sort of magical place outside but she sees birds and she sort of can see their freedom to kind of move beyond where she is but that nature also is this sort of enveloping thing that means that her life like our lives are brief you know you get so long and things like the, the plants sort of grow and they sort of take over and then she's in this other space where it's as if it's that, that lifetime has ended and then she becomes like a fossil. Yeah. So she's sort of still present in the world, but in a static sense. Is that, is that similar to the process of drawing and, and writing the text that you, you just know when that feels like it is your work, that is right, that this is yeah. this sort of thing? Yeah. You know, that, I mean, I didn't, I, I was quite particular about the animations. I want them to be like my drawings. I want them to be, to have that same kind of quality. So I didn't want them to be too, sort of have loads of effects in them and be sort of very different, um, very sort of far away from being handmade. Yeah. But that particular effect, I think is something that, you know, I can't imagine I would have been able to do that in the same way in a drawing. I probably could, but it just seemed like it was suitable and it didn't feel too much of a leap away from that sort of very sort of physical sense of drawing, you know? Yeah. If it, like it, it's really, um, you've been, you've been making paintings that connect to what's happening now for quite, quite a long time now that, that feels like you have developed this own, well, your, your own language, your own world in which they exist, but it's still interesting how they, how they connect to other sorts of cultural forms that are out there, you know, popular, even like the sort of animations that might have been made in the 1970s and 1980s. It's quite an interesting one that, but I often, when I've, when I've asked you questions before about, oh, does that link to 
comic panels or different, you know, as often it's been like, no, that's, that's you know, mm. I'm always <laughs> interested it's not, that you aren't referencing those things, they're just coming out of your, your work over and over again. The references are more around the input, aren't they? Or the, yeah, the they ideas. The, I suppose, you know, in terms of influences that, you know, my, my dad lives in Japan and he's lived there um, nearly all my life. He, oh. he's, lived there since I think I was seven so he's been there for a long long time and so the um those sort of graphic visuals that you see in Japanese prints say for example I've always been very familiar with I've always um sort of seen them and they've always been part there's some some aspect of kind of um imagery from Japan that's always been around me um mm. so maybe in a way it sort of channels some something of that which is really hard to explain it's like it doesn't belong to me because i'm not from japan but it, no. it's so rooted in my background that it does feel like it's quite a sort of dominant sort of thought oh. you know something about that kind of imagery um but I'm quite often, I think I was describing to you when I was draw, when I was painting some of the imagery that were, was of networks, I was mm-hmm. thinking, do it like you've got a set of felt pens and you're like a, someone who's obsessed about, you know, drawing a network, but you don't know what it looks like and you you just invent this thing quite obsessively. Make it feel like that. Because, yeah. th- so that really comes from, you know, thinking about, untaught artists or people who are quite sort of obsessive you know and don't share those sorts of rules about you know what high art might have been you know yeah that's definitely uh, that sort of a a disconnect but a freedom yeah to it yeah as well yeah what what's the that maybe is it connected to it that sense of free fall that is in a lot of the works as well this idea of yeah, you not completely in control of yourself as as you're passing through these spaces. Is that? Yeah, I mean, you're you're making me think of um, a couple of things that are really important to me. That uh, first one is just to let go, just to let whatever's going to happen in the work happen, and that is a type of free fall mm. that is very important. But the other thing is that in thinking about free fall and I have thought about it a lot um, because I was really struck by the Hito, Hito Steyl essay which is in her collection of essays called The Written and the way she talks about the way perspective in image making has been constructed over time in relation to the way that people either navigate you know she talks about ancient Arab sailors navigating against the horizon and the moon and Mm. that sense of then the space of an image having a kind of horizon line between ground and skies the formulation of images comes from our own navigation our own Mm. sort of experiences and the thing about the thing that struck me about that is that the way we look now like the way we're all looking now we're looking at multiple images all together of each other and we look at multiple images in no order on screens. And there's a kind of free fall, which means that there isn't a ground, like it isn't any more that we would necessarily make an image where things would be fixed. So for painting or image making, that mm. for me is like really exciting because I think, well, then we're at a period of time where we can really um look again at how we would make images in this age because some of the ways that we think about making images are can be sort of fixed to a a sort of previous experience you know or a previous Mm. way of looking and thinking Um, so i'm i think i'm always thinking i wouldn't say i'm a painter i wouldn't say i make sculptures i wouldn't say you know, an animator, I wouldn't sort of name any of these things. I'd say I can move around and everything is quite mobile and I get to do what I want. And 
I can make up the rules for what I'm making. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's do. also, it's a really, it's very, it feels very special, important that you're trying to deal with, with the most sort of contemporary sense of what it, of how we're, how we're existing, how we're surviving now, but you are, you know, you are using your hands, you're using a brush, you're using inks and stains and... I think that's the freedom that we have. You know, it sounds really contrary because it sounds like it's old fashioned, but it was my observation that we can't yet not yet, but maybe soon, but we can't record the images in our heads. Mm. You know, we actually can't, there's no way that you can record a dream. You can't record the imageries of, you know, remembering or, yeah. you, we, we can't record that, but we all use it and we're all sort of reliant on it. And we also have this kind of dexterity still in terms of like the gesture of making. And so the, the way that images are made when they appear on a screen or they appear sort of through like say taking a photograph of the camera is that they're framed in a particular way that gives us a sense of reality we think that tells us about reality mm. and yet at this period of time we know that none of those images that we see on screens can be relied on as a, a sort of genuine reality because we know how much can be um, sort of altered and corrupted through software or editing or whatever. Yeah. So we can't say, well, that's real anymore. We can say that that's, you know, could be real, but it's not reliable. So to draw something directly from your mind gives you a kind of license to try to identify what a reality might be. Mm. we're in a position yeah. where we can really think about that but also if we do it by hand on a piece of paper it isn't yet within a system like it might be on our phone to go off that could be easily collected as data in a system and it could have already entered into a sort of space where it could be used and transmitted and it, it is trapped within that network right but if you make a yeah. drawing on a piece of paper for yourself now, it's like it's really free. You know? <laughs> I, lo I love that idea, <laughs> releasing it. But it all, it's also, do you think then in these works, in that future when people are looking back to realise what they've lost, were you imagining that they'd got to the point where, they, where you could record what's in your mind? Yeah. 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 That's, that's the kind of breaking yeah. point. One of, one of the texts, I think, was about someone saying um, that they sort of switched the settings on their dreams yeah. so that they didn't download or they didn't download their dream. You know, that, that, that the way that, you know, the, we would be networked would be, you know, it's almost like we wouldn't know that we were networked. I mean, the idea was that it would be very, very scary to step outside of virtual reality because you would be terrified to be out in the world without um, any kind of device to tell you where to, how to get anywhere, where to go, that you could get lost, yeah. that you would, you know, something might, might happen to you and you couldn't get any help and you wouldn't be with your friends and you wouldn't be in contact, you know, and it just all seems so scary. You know, it's a persuasive thing that tells you that if you're and not that, I mean, I use technology and I like technology, I'm like anyone yeah. else, but it was just a, something that I, I thought it intrigued me, the, the relationships, yeah. the relationship we have now with technology and when we see where, how it can develop. Someone's, uh, Rhiannon's just written in the, in the chat about reading William Gibson stories in Burning Chrome about downloading dreams and marketing them? I don't we... know those stories. <laughs> <laughs> That's also the thing, because, I mean, that idea of downloading dreams and marketing them is, you know, it's very, it's very much a Philip K. Dick um, area as well. That's what he was really fascinated with, this yeah. sense of dislocated reality and um, yeah. auth authenticity in a way. I think... Um, you know, it was something that I was really aware of when I was making the work was that how mainstream sci-fi fiction had become, 
you know, how much more accessible, how much more interest there was in it. It's, it's not something that I particularly had read or been, you know, that into. But um, in doing the work, it, it became very interesting, you know. And I think there's something about the way that it shapes predictions of the way we might live that, that suddenly be, got sort of had a closer proximity to the way we were living. And that's maybe why it became um, much more sort of mainstream. Yeah. Okay, so people are starting. Yes, yeah, so if, any, if anyone else wants to ask questions, put them into the chat. So I see Barty's just asked something. So you've touched on ideas of nostalgia. Can you comment further on, on nostalgia within the work? Um, the work isn't, it's not meant to be nostalgic. I, I think the work is meant to be like now. It's yeah. meant to be like someone, I wanted to put together all the parts of ourselves, you know, so someone who kind of thinks like we all do on all different levels. You know, you have the personal, you have your emotional um, life, you have a, a sort of private space that might contain your anxieties or whatever. And then you have your relationships to, you know, the bigger picture, which is the, you know, the wider contemporary concerns, you know, things that are prevalent. And we're all doing that all the time. So I wanted the work to be like, what it's like to be a human, to be me as a human in the world today, now. And that probably does include some sort of ideas of how you look back and how you look forward. Yeah. But I, I think I, you. I think you referred to it as the nostalgia of people in the future looking back. Yes, I was imagining moment. people in the future looking back at this time and thinking, "Oh yeah, remember when we were being seduced by technology?" Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you've given yourself license to the world that you've made. You can you can sort of talk about anything, can't you? You can really talk about full range of emotions and what it means to be human in, in a, such a direct way. Yeah. It's, quite, it's really powerful actually what you've made. Thank you. I, I'm, um, I feel like it's um, a sort of constantly interesting way to work because it really does just track what I'm really interested in. So it just feels like, what will I do next? But I already can think of that because I know what I'm interested in. And then it feels like, you can just sort of feed into your own interests all the time, you know, whatever you're researching or looking at or thinking about, it just all feels like it's just very, it matches like just what you want to do. Yeah. Okay, I've got another one. Uh, do you prefer, at the, so at, at the moment, are you preferring you more and using technology or traditional mediums in your art? Sort of. Um, about that, I think, Right now, this minute, because of lockdown, I think I've learned to use technology much more. Uh, I've been in a situation because I, I was at home for seven weeks, more or less. Pretty much today is the first day back in the studio for me. So I started using technology as a way to extend the work. And I really like using it and I'm really interested in, uh, I really like making the sound, I really like making the animations and I'm interested to see how I can make that function. But I think at very base level, it all comes out of drawing, which is a traditional medium, as you put it. Um, that, you know, it does, I use traditional mediums, media to draw you know, paper and watercolour yeah. and gouache. Yeah, and even using technology isn't taking you away from doing that. It's still like one of the essential skills. Well, I don't tend to think of things as very binary. So I don't think no. it's like either or. I think it's that yeah. and that. These things yeah. in flux or in flow with each other. So I, you know, I don't, I don't feel like it's, yeah. No, it's, it's interesting which, which technologies just remain for such a long time. You know, they're very old technologies, but they still are so versatile. They're just really successful, aren't they? The, the technology of mark making. Yeah. Is, you know. Yeah, I think once I'd reminded myself, because it's like, it's not like I didn't know it. I just sort of forgot about it. Once I reminded myself 
just uh, invent in drawing. You yeah. know, just sort of try to project and invent. Then I think the, before I made this kind of work when I was much younger, I had made work from photographs, using photographs and then sort of taking parts from photographs. So I spent a lot of time being frustrated, looking around for photographs to paint. <laughs> then when I thought, well, actually, it's all in your head, just invent it. Just, you don't need to rely on anything else. It felt so wonderful to be able to be that direct. Yeah, that's fantastic. Was that like, I've, got, I've put this painting behind me that's in, from Birmingham show, the two yeah. paintings there that were partly about where you were living in, in Birmingham at the time. Yeah. Are, they, are they from photographs or were they already into that stage just from your, just from yeah. your head? Uh, this is one thing that, that has come out of looking at drawings again, is that if I am remembering a lot of the earlier work, like those paintings were really about when a memory comes to mind and you just wonder why you're thinking of that. So when I knew I was going to have work in that Birmingham show, yeah. I, those were the images that came to mind about Birmingham. The, <laughs> the particular images that I thought that crystallises for me. If I think of my time in Birmingham as a student, that's what it was like. And if I'm making a drawing from memory like that, sometimes I'm quite intrigued by how your brain starts delivering all this memory like you start remembering exactly what the gas fire looked like exactly what the door looked like you know you can suddenly access all this stuff that your brain said you actually don't need it yeah you know? that is amazing yeah what what you find in your brain yeah <laughs> there's a couple more questions one's about color palette yeah about how conscious the, the uh, decisions are about color i think that's that is an interesting one yeah, I, I never use white. Um, <laughs> I paint on dyed silk, which is usually pale pink or a colour called sable. Um, and yes, I'm very conscious about the atmosphere that I want for the work. So that comes from the colour that the work's going to be. So the one that the image of the painting there yeah. It's really important that the colours were sort of beautiful and sort of rotten, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that the, yeah, the colours are really particular, but I think the most particular thing is that I never, I never use white. Yeah. I think, I think um, there's a number of students from the Royal College, hello students from the Royal College. <laughs> but I, 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 I've taught quite a lot and I know when I'm teaching um, painting, Quite often I'm saying, you know, white is a thing that you can use a lot of and it sort of doesn't allow you to see colour very easily. Mm. So, you know, it's just something that's useful to me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's another, uh, this question, do you think, have you reflected more on your work because of isolation or do you think that it's the same level of reflection? Um, if I'm truly honest, I'd say less. <laughs> because, if I'm being really honest, because yeah. I find it so hard to concentrate. Yeah. I mean, I'm really happy to be here in my studio today because um, I've got a full house and I'm very happy that my sons are back home because I, I love them to bits. So I'm really happy, but it's very distracting. <laughs> um, so... I think I am better when I, I'm, I get a bit of space and I can think better. I get, I get easily distracted at home. And also I get this feeling that I'm not doing anything. Yeah. I get guilt trips. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one in relation to guilt trips. Do you consider your work in any way spiritual in terms of automatic drawing or? Um, I, a bit because I made some work for um, one of the art night commissions that was in the William Morris gallery mm. that was in relation I was asked to respond to Madge Gill and her work and she was a, a spiritualist who she was a psychic who was um, she lived in Walthamstow she lived in this borough Waltham Forest which is where my studio is and I live 
and she thought that she had a spirit guide that told her what to do so she just every drawing every text she made was she thought she was just channeling all this stuff okay. and i have in the past thought i will make a text drawing and i will just try to listen to what words come to mind and i wonder if that's me thinking or whether that's something yeah. else you yeah. know i i i'm quite interested in that but i'm not and i'm also interested in a kind of broader view of us in relation to the universe mm. so i'm very interested in that but i'm i don't subscribe to any kind of um a formal religion or you know i, I don't yeah. think things like that i suppose that, that just the concept of the network of being part of a network of being an organism within an organic environment that you can you know you are receiving input and you are outputting is, is an equivalent in a way so we are part part of the universe we are organic beings in an organic universe and what is striking for me, and I've used it in my work, is that the matter, our matter, what makes up our body is when we die, it returns to the, the matter of the universe. The matter of the universe is always the same volume or same amount. I never know how to describe that in terms of physics. <laughs> but the volume of the universe never changes. And so we might not have our consciousness, we don't know, but our consciousness might not be in the universe in the same way, but our matter is that's yeah. amazing to me it is it's great well it's also that 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 sort of talk of you know these quite big ideas where you can begin to lose yourself in them is also that feeling of that free falling and the, and the movement in the animation has that sense of yeah allowing yourself to to, to lose yourself within something else yeah, and also for me, it's like allowing myself to make things that look how I'd like things to look. <laughs> you know, and not worrying about whether that kind of is um, in accordance with the way other things might look. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really great. I think we're coming to the end. Then. So I think it might be good just to mention some of the other, the other shows that might happen at some point in the future, depending on all the variables that are bouncing around at the moment. So. Yeah. You've got the, the the solo show with us, but then you've got um, a show that will happen at, in Dundee as yeah, well. Yeah, so I've got one person show at DCA in Dundee, which hopefully will be in November. And cool. I have a one person show at Kunsthalle Gießen, which is in Germany, which was going to be in September, but it's now in January. Cool. And the Max Mara um, show, Will be. Oh, yeah, we haven't even talked about that. <laughs> yeah, so that I was meant to be right now in Italy on residency, and obviously I can't go, and because of the other things that I have, other commitments, I won't be going until next April, actually. It's right. delayed for a year. Yeah. So then the Whitechapel show will happen after that, and then that will go to Collezioni Marimotti. That's so. Cool. But in a way, that's quite, it works out quite well that you, you know, you won the prize this year and then you get to do the residency next year and then a show and it sort of like extends it all out, doesn't it? So Yeah, it also acknowledges that this, for most people, I think, is a bit of a null bit of time. Yeah. You know, you just can't do. Yeah. So, yeah, they've been very thoughtful about that, I think. Cool. All right. Well, we're, we're totally looking forward to getting all of these works off these walls and into the gallery to try and make a new space and a new place for us to all lose ourselves in in the future uh, thank you very much emma thanks that's yeah, really great and lovely um and thanks everyone for for dropping in on this um we, um, we'll have some more come in thanks thanks brenda i could see you clapping then that was nice <laughs> <laughs> um we'll hope to see you soon lots of thank yous coming in um, um, I can't even remember what our next thing is, but I'm sure there's more things coming up that you should come along to and look out for. We'll be releasing dates as, as soon as we know dates for Emma's show. We will put them out to share with everybody and um, hope to see you all soon. All right. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. See you. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Bye.